So we are actually now recording and uh, it should be fine for you to take it over. Thank you so very much, Dr. Boss. Um, I'm really glad to be here and I'm really glad to connect with all of you. I look forward to your questions. Um, as I think that uh, you can tell from my title, I, I consider myself to be a humanist now, a humanist always, but I hope that some of the pieces of my story uh, resonate with those of you who are in other fields, those of you who are pursuing a master's degree. Um, I think that there will be some, um, some ideas and, and some takeaways that, that may be relevant um, to you, uh, whatever your chosen field and, and career track is. So um, if there are topics I don't cover and you, you wish that I, I had, I, I welcome uh, you to bring them up in the Q&A period. So um, if you've taken a look at the blog I wrote um, for this session, um, you know that I um, was a PhD who had planned to pursue a, an academic career. I had in fact hoped to be um, a professor of English literature from the time I was about 14 years old. And um, I ended up choosing a different path um, and the, the story of how I got from, from this person who had a very strong identity as, as somebody who wanted to do this one thing to somebody whose identity kind of morphed into something else is, is the story I'm gonna tell you in this presentation, uh, which I've titled, uh, How a Scholar of 19th Century Novels Found a New Plot Line. Um, I will also be talking about pathways and plot lines, plural, because I think it's very important to remember that any of us in, um, in a lifetime makes a lot of different decisions about whether to go this way or that way. And so that, that's going to be kind of a recurring metaphor of my talk. So I'll start out um, by telling you a little bit about the beginning of my journey, of my graduate school journey. I started my PhD in English at Johns Hopkins 20 years ago, um, hard for me to believe, in 2000. And uh, I had a very strong sense that um, my end goal was um, a tenure track job in um, a university very, very much like the one where I had studied as an undergraduate. And um, later in, in my time as a graduate student, about year four, year five, I started to have doubts about that plan. Um, I think that, that those doubts had to do with a number of different things. One um, was that I was um, rounding, uh, <laughs> I was rounding the 30 mark. I was, I was starting to be 30. I was looking around, I was seeing all my friends um, from back home in Kansas, where I grew up, um, settling down. Um, they had their chosen careers. They had, they had a home, uh, a life. They, they were kind of getting settled in life. And I still felt, felt like I was a career student. Um, and so I thought, you know, if I get a tenure track job, I'll have seven more years of waiting until I'm, I'm a tenured professor. And what if I don't even get a tenure track job? What if I get a postdoc or um, a visiting assistant professorship or um, uh, an instructor position? I have to wait and wait to, to sort of set down roots. And so that was, that was part of my um, restlessness, I think. Um, another piece of that, I think, was the shift from coursework um, in my early, early years of, of the PhD to research, I found the solitude of humanities uh, research and scholarship to be really difficult. Um, I, as I began writing my dissertation um, uh, in the library of the, uh, there, there was a li the library had four sub basements. That's, that's how it was constructed, um, A, B, C, and D none of them with windows. And I was on the, the fourth sub basement down. So no windows in my little carol um, writing this dissertation. And um, I realized that's not the experience of everybody who 
you know, is in a lab or um, is doing field work uh, in a social science field, but I found that solitude really difficult. So that was part of my, my reason for, for rethinking um, my chosen career track. And I, I walked into my advisor's office in, in about 2005, it was maybe 2004, and I just kind of blurted out what was on my mind. I said, you know, I don't think I'm gonna finish. I, I don't think this is worth it. I, um, I, I wanna do something else. And she said, well, what is this other thing that you want to do? And I had done zero thinking about that. Um, I said, I think maybe I could be a journalist was my thought. You know, I, I'm a good writer. I can, I, can, I can be a journalist. And she could tell that I had given this about zero thought. Um, and so she said, <laughs> I, I see you laughing. Um, she said, listen, you are four years into this program. Maybe I was five years in at that point. You are so close. Um, finish this degree. Um, you will have a PhD. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, you can do so much with this degree. Um, even if you don't go into academia, just finish. And so she convinced me and I did finish. And um, as luck would have it, um, I got um, an assistant professor position um, at a university outside the US. Uh, at the time, um, I had a personal reason for being there. My very long-term boyfriend was um, doing his, um, his, his field work in anthropology there. And so I took this job and I, I moved to Beirut and um, it was, it felt professionally really good, um, I have to say. Um, I felt like I was doing something um, for which I had been well-trained. I loved teaching. Uh, I love my students. It felt like a really good professional fit. Um, but a number of other things happened around that time which is that I began to apply for permanent positions back in the States, um, which was really hard to do. Uh, there were very few of them in um, my field at the time. Uh, I broke up with my boyfriend. Um, and uh, so I had no, I no longer had this reason to be in, um, in Beirut. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I started thinking at the age of, I guess I was, I guess I was about 32 at that point, that um, I was going to start my life all over again in a brand new city. Who, know, who knows if I'd have friends and family nearby. Um, and that was if I was lucky. It, that was if I was lucky to get an academic job. And I just, I, I did a lot of soul searching at that point. I thought, you know, I, I wanna have some choice about where I live in, in the world. I don't, I don't just wanna go to the one place that will have me and wait around and see if I get tenure. I, I really want to sort of exercise some more control over the life that I want to live. And so, I, um, I had a service opportunity around that time um, at my, the university um, that introduced me to this world of um, uh, higher education outside of universities. So these were nonprofits and um, consulting firms and, um, and government um, agencies that were working in the field of international higher education, uh, working to promote um, student mobility, um, collaborations between universities. And this was a real eye-opener for me. I thought, you know, I didn't even know people, they, these jobs, I, I never knew that they existed and they required a real knowledge of, of the culture of universities. Um, and a real commitment to what universities are about and what higher education is about. And I thought, I could, I could do this. I, I, this is interesting to me. So 
I started um, in the summer of 2008, kind of doing my homework and uh, trying to find out what these jobs entailed. And um, as I noted in my blog, if you've taken a look at that, I started doing a lot of informational interviews, which um, if you haven't heard of those before, are um, interviews not for a job, but um, sort of conversations to learn about a profession that you're interested in. So you might call somebody up or, or contact somebody in your network. Maybe it's a friend of a friend or you know, a friend of a, par of a parent or um, uh, a family friend and um, ask them to talk to you about um, their job and, and how they got into that line of work. And um, if you would like some more tips on how to, um, how to approach those conversations, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit more about it. Um, but it's, it's a great way to kind of get your feet wet in a field um, and uh, learn more about whether a particular career is interesting to you. Um, and it just so happens that one of those conversations led to a, um, an opportunity to apply for a real job. Um, and that happened to be my first role at the organization that I'm, I'm at now, the Council of Graduate Schools, back in 2008. And um, I have, uh, over the past 12 years in the organization, I've I've evolved a lot in my job and in my responsibilities. Um, and today my job um, is a combination of research, which I, of course I've been trained to do, um, as well as fundraising and grant writing, which is something that I think I, I have definitely learned on the job. Um, but uh, often when, you are writing a compelling grant, you really have to fall back on your research skills and your ability to construct a compelling argument. And so there's some, some crossover there. And then um, also communications. And um, I, I do a lot of work with other staff to um, uh, work with the media on stories on graduate education, um, to uh, write, um, articles and blogs and, and different um, communication pieces that go out in our um, newsletters. Um, I, I collaborate with other staff on the strategy, the communication strategy uh, for the organization. So I get to do a lot of different things. And um, as somebody who I think felt very sort of restricted by the narrowness of my field, um, of, of my scholarly um, training who really wanted to be able to do a broader range of things. Um, that's very satisfying. And as I said in my blog as well, it's also really satisfying to work on projects that um, have outcomes that are really broadly shared with universities across the country and, and to be able to, um, to have an impact on, on students and on um, on universities in that way. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the skills that, or the lessons learned that I think that I got through my journey. And if there's time, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the, the actual work I've done at, at my organization, CGS, on career pathways. So um, these are some of the things that I think are really applicable to people in a broad range of fields um, and to both masters and doctoral students. Um, and uh, the first is, again, as I said before, there is more, one, more than one fork in the road. Um, at the time that I, I left academia, um, I really thought like, this was the last career decision <laughs> I was going to make. I don't know how I got that in my head, but there is really your life, um, anybody's life is going to have different opportunities for um, to make decisions about where you go. Um, my field, the humanities, does not have as much um, flexibility, I believe, about um, moving back and forth between academia and industry 
or academia and other sectors. I think um, there's more of a tradition of hiring people out of industry um, um, in some fields. So somebody might might be in academia for a while or and leave and come back, or they might have um, multiple appointments at the same time. That's less less the case in my field. And so I, I did make a, a decision with um, implications. You know, I, I think at this point, I, I'm not going to be a competitive candidate for an assistant professor position, um, even though that's part of my training. But I, um, I'm fortunate that uh, I'm very happy with, with where I landed. Um, second, and I mentioned this, do, do your research about careers. Um, I think that one of the skills you get as a researcher is um, cer a certain level of organization um, in gathering information and evidence um, it's it's different kind of evidence, obviously, um, when you're um, when you're gathering information about careers. But you know, I I got all my binders out and I I <laughs> I, I I did my thing when I was job searching. I I um, I had a certain system in place for for organi organizing all that information and and um, and and trying to make an informed choice. Um, do informational interviews. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this in the Q&A because I really think that that is very important, not only for gathering information, but building confidence. Um, if, if you go into your first interview uh, for a job out of academia and it's in a completely new sector, and you've never really learned to talk to people in that sector, whether it's government or, or industry or, um, or nonprofits, it can be pretty intimidating. And if you've done the informational interviews, you've gotten some practice at talking to people outside uh, of, of academia and it really helps. Um, The fourth one is really important, I think, is learn, learning to speak other professional language languages um, and learning about the cultures of other um, sectors and organizations. Uh, trying to think about um, just the language you use in talking about your skills and your um, your training is really important. And, um, you know, I, I, was, I was trained, I think, in a culture that was very cerebral, um, very sort of intellectual, liked big words, liked long sentences. Um, that's the way we talked. It was, it was part of the culture. That doesn't go over well everywhere, you know. Learning to speak clearly, um, concisely, um, and knowing your audience is really important. Um, fifth is um, kind of counterintuitive, but I call it speaking confidently about uncertainty. Um, it's really important when um, you talk about your career decisions to just own your, your uncertainty. Um, you have every right to be unsure about what you wanna do. Um, and I think when I went into my advisor's office all those years ago, you know, I, I was profusely apologizing I, you know, I presented it as just this terrible failure on my part to have a change of heart. And it's okay to have a change of heart. Um, and it's good to sort of think about how you want to present that indecision and, um, and, and, and really feel entitled to that indecision. That doesn't mean you shouldn't choose your moments going around telling people that you don't know what you're going to do next, but it's okay to be uncertain. Sorry, my, my children have joined us. Just let me, let me shut the door. Um, and then finally, um, 
I would say don't underestimate the emotional skills um, that you gain in a, in a PhD program. Um, again, like I said, I was very focused on my brain. Um, that was the thing that I had spent all this time cultivating, but resilience, patience, persistence, um, the ability to deal with frustration um, is really incredibly useful in other fields as well. And that is something that um, will be a huge asset to you. If you have finished a master's degree, if you've finished a PhD, you know something about persistence and resilience. So I'm going to pause there. I have a number of other, I have more slides, but um, it's, we're 23 minutes in yeah. and um, I'm going to pause here and see if um, there are any questions and comments. I am going to stop the recording. We can always start.